This is Kimberly Quinn, host of the Minecraft podcast, and I can't tell you how much fun I have had doing this podcast. I, I started when the world closed over the pandemic in, a, in an attempt to spread some positivity out there and give people some strategies to enhance their own well-being and reduce anxiety and all that. Now, two years later, we're still going strong and now listened to by 52 countries across the world. And I've even helped some of my students get going with their own podcasts. It's super easy to do. And I'll tell you, if you haven't heard about Anchor by Spotify, it is the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. I'll just explain for you. Anchor has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. When hosting on Anchor, you can distribute your podcast on listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. It is a ball. Start today. Greetings, Minecrafters, and welcome to another, what I hope to be, fabulous discussion today. My name is Kimberly Quinn, and I am just so thrilled, and I'll just give you the atmosphere. It's uh, mid-September, right? And uh, the leaves, well, I'm in northern Vermont, as you, I think you all know, and the leaves are just starting to turn, which is kind of late, actually, but it's raining and peaceful. I'm just taking a short little uh, break from everything else I'm doing academic and, and for well-being and everything to, to have a chat with you about allowing, you know, we don't allow ourselves to be bored. You know, I don't, I'm not sure when that ever, when that ever happened. You know, I think back in the fifties and, you know, and, and forget the fifties, well, the fifties. Okay. I wasn't around for the fifties, but you know, people, I think we pretty much know, obviously there's no uh, technology. The TVs weren't even in every household and even the households who were fortunate enough to have one, there were only a few stations, blah, blah, blah. And typically it was the mothers back then, right? Because it was a different, different times. Send everybody outside. So I was, using, I was kind of using the 50s example, but I grew up in the 70s, basically. I'm fa- a fabulous 57, early 80s, 70s, early 80s. So I was a little kid in the 70s. And it was the same, really. I mean, I'm sure we had a few more stations, but no computers. And in our neighborhood, you just you you knew where the kids were all hanging out by where the bikes were laying on the lawn, right? And and then eventually, and it was usually the mothers still they'd call you in six o'clock or whatever for dinner. But we were out, and I don't know that we ever had a a worry because actually it is a worry these days about being bored. What if I can't find my people and ride bikes? What if I can't play all these make pretend games in the woods? We used to say play Indians. I can't say that anymore. We used to play that all the time in the woods. And again, that's in the quotes of the times, not currently, um, because that wouldn't be politically correct. So I wouldn't use it. I'm just just being descriptive. And we did so many, we just did so many cool things. And we didn't really, we sort of naturally were just creative. And you hear nowadays, not just with kids. Oh, no, we don't want to be bored. We can't let them be bored. You know, I hear adults talking, grownups are talking about, you know, we don't want them to be bored. We don't want students to be bored. Why not? Why don't we want to allow ourselves to be bored? And it's just so crazy. So my inspiration for today is coming from Richard Carlson. And he's the author of the Don't Sweat the Small Stuff books. And there's a lot of them. So if you hear me kind of, you know, you know, using these sources, he's written, a, there's Don't Sweat the Small Stuff in a bunch of whole different uh, in editions. There's one with love, one with money. This one is, and it's all small stuff. So anyway. Richard's talking about being bored. I thought, wow, that just resonates with me because I was just having a talk with my Minecraft students this week, which was similar. We didn't use the word bored, actually. But we talked about what, why it's important to have, you know, let ourselves have idle thoughts. So they're look, looking at me a little perplexed because we thought this was all about mindfulness and being in the moment. Well, it is. We're talking about consciously choosing to take some time to let, uh, to let our mind idle, not being on autopilot, which is different. Autopilot is the biggest thief of life minutes that there could possibly be. This is a conscious choice. And I gave the example of when I lay on my back like a five-year-old and look at the clouds and make shapes, that's an example of, of idle thinking, right? I, and in fact, I could have sworn that, you know, the ocean was in my future because I kept seeing humpback whales all over the place. 
But this is a thing where, and it just creativity just floods. So anyway, um, Richard starts out the talk for him with, he says, for many of us, our lives are so filled with stimuli, not to mention responsibilities, that it's almost impossible for us to sit still and do nothing, much less relax, even for a few minutes. A friend of mine said to me, people are no longer human beings. We should call them human doings. This, so this idea of the human doings, it brings me back to when I, I wrote my first book, which was actually in, in uh, the context of young mothers becoming, becoming human doings. And actually, I think I touched on it again at a different point, and I forget what, but it doesn't matter because our, our, whatever the context, our whole society is so fast-paced, you know, so media-saturated. I'm not saying that that, you know, technology is all bad, right? We've, we can talk to people across the country and world and for little, if any, money now, right? Because emailing is just free and, you know, um, you know, back other than back in the day, as a kid, God, you couldn't call, you know, Poland or something without it costing you you know, like a fortune, right? As they say, an arm and a leg. And now we can, you know, reach people all over the place uh, relatively easily. So there's definitely some positives, but there's also, there's also, you know, there's definitely some, some not so positives. We just come out and say it negatives, right? Because our, our bandwidth is shorter. You know, I've, I've seen it, I've seen it over the, you know, last 12 years teaching and then with the pandemic on top of it, I don't just mean students. I mean, all of us, the season, you know, grown ups and everything, we just have a much, you know, uh, we just have much less, you know, attention span. And there was a book a long time ago. After, I'm not, I didn't plan for that. So I don't remember the author. The book was called The Shallows. And it was, you know, and it was probably, I don't even know, 15, 15 years ago, if not more. And the, he was even onto it already with how much technology is just shrinking us, our, you know, it's really affecting the brain in lots and lots of ways. Obviously, socially, you know, the, the, you know, the good old-fashioned, you know, uh, face-to-face has disappeared. And so, anyway, a lot of that has to do with what we're talking about is good old-fashioned boredom. You know, kids going out into the yard, and they don't stay in that bored place very long because they naturally have it filled up with authentic things, not text messages and beeps and buzzes and notifications and Instagram and Snapchats and likes and all those other things, all these other things, they just get caught up in leaf piles or they get caught up in this. So same thing. I don't want to keep it too much on kids because it's not just kids. It's all of us. We don't, we don't sort of allow for that idle time. And I had a student just yesterday, actually, we were talking about the importance of idle time. She said, one thing that's hard for me with that, she said, is if I don't, if I'm not constantly productive, I feel guilty. I feel like I should be. It's very difficult for me to just have idle time because I feel like I'm like I'm slacking. And so, so back to Richard Carlson, then he says, I was first exposed to the idea that occasional boredom can actually be good for me while, while studying with a, um, a therapist in, 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 oh, L- La, oh, La Conner, Washington. I thought I said LA first. La Conner, Washington, a tiny little town with very little quote, to do, end quote. After finishing our first day together, I asked my instructor, what is there to do around here at night? He responded by saying, what I'd like you to do is allow yourself to be bored. Do nothing. This is part of your training. At first, I thought he was kidding. Why on earth would I choose to be bored? I asked. I went, and then he went on to explain that if you allow yourself to be bored, even for an hour or less, and don't fight it, the feelings of boredom will be replaced with feelings of peace. And after a little practice, you'll learn to relax. No, and that little that little paragraph is just is making a lot of sense to me because many of us, even before the pandemic, have lost our ability, for lack of a better way to say it, or have a very diminished ability to relax. I don't think many of us even know what that's like anymore. And, you know, some of you have heard me on different episodes that I'm not into, I'm not into um, relaxed shaming people because we don't always relax in the same way. So it's important, you know, we really don't ever know whatever somebody's thinking or feeling or if they're relaxing or not unless we ask them. But we often assume if somebody's just go, go, go and doesn't want to sit on the couch that they're not relaxing, which is not necessarily true 
if there's somebody who relaxes better in motion, such as I do. I, I, I relax better running, skiing, being out in nature, walking, hiking, that sort of thing. But if they're more like in motion as far as gerbil on crack, you know, just filling up their day and their lives and just, you know, that's not relaxing that no matter how you cut it up, that's just, uh, sort of entering into this, you know, I don't want to say neurotic is maybe a little over the top, but this compulsive state of doing like my students said too, or, you know, she felt like, you know, guilty about not, you know, not being able to stop and just, and not do nothing, so to say, and just, you know, be present in those life minutes. Then Richard uh, goes on to say, much to my surprise, he was absolutely right. At first, I could barely stand it. I was so used to doing something every second that I really struggled to relax. But after a while, I got used to it and have long since learned to enjoy it. I'm not talking about hours of idle time or laziness, but simply learning the art of relaxing or just being rather than doing for a few minutes each day. Oh my gosh, just like everything we talk about, right? Or lots of it anyway. We're not talking about lazy. I have a huge issue with lazy myself. My kids knew growing up that the two things I couldn't stand both started with L, lying and lazy. Did not allow either one. So we're not talking about lazy. We're talking about not being present in this moment. And even with idling, we're talking about idling is still mindful, really, because we're opening the door for creativity. It's it's different than just being distracted and pulled out of our life minutes. It's not the same at all. And then he says, uh, there isn't a specific technique other than to consciously do nothing. Just sit still, perhaps look out the window and notice your thoughts and feelings. At first you may get a little anxious, but each day it will get a little easier. He says the payback is tremendous. Yeah, like it adds years to our lives. Absolutely, Richard, because he's talking about being mindful, basically. And then, so this is the part where he, he gets into what we've been talking about a lot, you know, since really since the, I started the channel with the very foundation of Minecraft being thoughts come first and feeling second, which also happens to be the foundation for cognitive behavioral therapy, right? We, and we can, we can know what's zipping through our heads by how we feel. And, the, you know, our feelings are a barometer for what's going on in the mind, right? So if we're feeling nervous, we're having nervous thinking, which is probably very repetitive. And since the brain loves that, it's like catnip for the mind. It builds and builds, gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Hence, we end up feeling nervous for a very long time. They even pick up that ball and run with it the next day, right? So Richard says, much of our anxiety and inner struggle stems from our busy, overactive minds, always needing something to entertain them, something to focus on, and always wondering what's next. While we're eating dinner, we wonder what's for dessert. While eating dessert, we ponder what we should do afterward. After that, after that evening, it's what shall we do this weekend? After we've been out, we walk into the house and immediately turn on the television, pick up the phone, open a book, or start cleaning. It's almost as though we're frightened at the thought of having not of having something to do even for a minute. Oh, sorry, not having something to do even for a minute. We're frightened of not having something to do. Imagine that. Just imagine that, because I think times have changed a lot like that. You know, pre-technology, you know, people looked forward to their off time, I think, so much more. And since technology wasn't there, people did other things that just weren't nearly as stimulating. I mean, of course, they, they you know, they did, they had recreation and leisure. They played board games and went camping and you know, played tennis or whatever they did, but they, it wasn't the, the overstimulation piece was just not the same. And the other thing with that is that the 24 seven element was missing. You know, if you played board games back in 1952 or watched the one station, you watched I Love Lucy, let's say in 1952, um, you know, that show, and then that was it with the cell phone, ding, 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 all the 24 seven. And the minute we check it, whether it's positive or negative or whatever, we're ripped out of the moment and there's a shift in mood. We know that to be sure. Plus, I did research on that a few years ago and it's typically negative. There's a diff definitely a shift. It's also typically negative. So allowing our mind to idle, meaning no technology, the clouds listening to the rain like I was doing earlier, 
uh, just, God, it's just, it's, it's, it's a massage for the mind is what it is. A massage for the mind. And then Richard says, the beauty of doing nothing is that it teaches you to clear your mind and relax. It allows your mind the freedom to not know for a brief period of time. I love that. To not know because we, I just think we are just so, you know, pulled in because our minds have been conditioned. Again, the book, The Shallows, talks a lot about that actually in there. It's a really, it's a really good read. And that was just the beginning of what we're seeing now. Uh, and then Richard says, um, just like your body, your mind needs an occasional break from its hectic routine. When you allow your mind to take a break, it comes back stronger, sharper, more focused and creative. This is so important. And this was actually our, our, you know, our conversation yesterday in my, in my Minecraft classes. And it, in both, in both the classes I had yesterday, students came up on their own with, they called it a brain break. Don't need to think, just a brain break. And it's not, it's not a vegetative state like autopilot. It's, it's a, it's on purpose to just listen to the rain with intention and being present kind of as if your life depended on it, as John Kabat-Zinn would say. And then uh, Richard, Richard winds up with, when you allow yourself to be bored, it takes an enormous amount of pressure off you to be performing and doing something every second of every day. Now, when either of my two children says to me, Daddy, I'm bored, I respond by saying, great, be bored for a while, it's good for you. Once I say this, they always give up on the idea of me solving their problem. You probably never thought someone would actually suggest that you allow yourself to be bored. I guess there's a first time for everything. And again, I'm, you know, I'm, put, I'm sort of holding what Richard is saying or, you know, kind of framing that inside the whole concept of mindfulness because that's really what, he's, really what he's talking about. He's not talking about autopilot. That's when our mind wanders and lands often in negative places and rehearsing old narratives and all that kind of thing. That's the exact opposite of what we're talking about here. Again, the clouds, the rain, you know, I picture kids out in the leaves, grown-ups out in the weeds, um, to just, to just really embrace the, that really simple, simple sort of, um, minimal, say minimal thinking, because the thoughts are, are really rarely ever gone totally. That would be at the level of Zen monks, probably. You know, that obviously the thoughts are still crossing over, but a much simple, much simpler, slowed down, imaginative, creative, purposeful, mindful state is what we're talking about. Excellent. Okay, this is Kimberly Quinn signing off from the beautiful northern Vermont. Have a mindful, purposeful day. <laughs>